I could leave $75 billion to a bunch of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and if I left it to 35 of them, uh, they'd each have a couple billion dollars. They could put it out of 5 percent, have 100 million. I mean, is that a great way to allocate resources in the United States? Because that's what you're doing with, through the tax code is you're affecting the allocation of resources. YouTube, YouTube, what is going on? And my flare truckers. Hey, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the ones that made it happen. We finally made it to 500 subscribers. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough. But if you're not subscribed to the channel, hey man, take the opportunity now. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And if you're already subscribed to the channel, throw a like on this video. A like don't cost you anything to throw on this video. It is for free, so please show your boy some love. But anyhow, what I got for y'all today is Warren Buffett. If you don't know who Mr. Warren Buffett is, please go do your research, look him up, check him out. This guy owns so many businesses till it's pathetic. I mean, like, he owns everything from Dairy Queen to Flying J Pilot. If you're not accustomed to sitting there listening, you're not accustomed to, you know, paying attention to what's going on and where things came from and where they're going, then hey, this video is not gonna be for you. You might want to find something else to look at, but this video is going to be kind of boring. If you are looking to seek knowledge and you're trying to figure out what's going on with the system, hey, this video might be kind of informative to you. We are here this morning with Warren Buffett, the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. And Warren, we want to thank you very much for your time this morning. Well, thanks for having me. Mr. Buffett is definitely one of the major players in the game in this whole corporation field. Check out how he explains how he acquired Flying J Pilot back in 2017 in a two-part deal. Basically, that's going to give him majority of the stake in Flying J Pilot by 2023, which is this year. Joining us right now is Jimmy Haslam. He is the CEO of Pilot Flying J. And just this morning, in the last 15, 20 minutes, there was a deal that was announced that Berkshire Hathaway is buying a 39.6% stake in Pilot Flying J. Jimmy, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having us on, Becky. So how, how did this deal come together? What what, what happened? Explain. How, how did you two meet? You no, no, you do it, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, we have a mutual friend, Byron Trott, who uh, Warren has actually loaned known longer than we have and Byron's company BDT owns 5% of our company and he introduced the two of us back in May and over the last several months we built we're able to put together a deal that we think makes a lot of sense for both companies. Let's talk through that deal. A 39.6% stake I, that will then go to an 80% stake in the year 2023. Why why that structure? Yeah, I think it's 38.6. Yes, 38.6. But I'd be glad to make it 39. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he negotiated hard for 39.6. <laughs> so wh why set up that structure? I mean, Warren, this is not a situation where you're short of cash. Well, <laughs> we, we've set up a lot of different structures that fit what the managing party would like to have. And, uh, you know, with the bumpkins, we did it in 1983. It's the same structure. Uh, so their situation in terms of their family and their partnership and everything made this logical and uh, and we have this two-step arrangement and we've had other two-step arrangements and, and Marmon with the Prisker family we had a three-step sure. arrangement sure. Uh, so we try to fit what the seller would like and you know with families and everything you can you can have different arrangements uh, Jimmy this is a situation where this is a family-run company for almost 60 years uh, we're talking about the number 15 on Forbes list of private companies in terms of size 750 retail locations in 44 states uh, some of the net metrics are pretty amazing uh, fourth largest tanker fleet in the nation just by what you're sending around to make sure you have enough fuel at all those stops uh, talk about the company how you built it and yeah, why the, make this transition? It's, it's like a lot of companies Warren has bought. It's a family-owned, family-run company. Started by my dad in 1958 with one gas station. We've changed over the years. Gas stations, sea stores, truck stops. And we're now a huge distributor of fuel, gasoline and diesel fuel. We sell more diesel fuel over the road than anybody in the United States. And it's a big logistics company. Every 22 seconds, we drop a load of petroleum somewhere in the United States or Canada at one of our stops. Also, a big food company. We'll sell over... Million, a billion dollars in food and over two billion dollars retail this year. Wow. We're in 44 states and U.S. and Canada. Well, you must have a pretty good idea of what's happening in the U.S. economy at even, any given point, given some of those metrics. How, yeah, how Warren are and I were talking earlier. I think we'd say it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, 
particularly strong in uh, Florida, particularly strong in California, and of course Texas with the return of the oil boom and fracking is really strong. So it's certainly better than it was several years ago. Why, why does Berkshire seem like a good fit for you? Um, Long-term investor. Um, I think I'm right, Warren, of the <laughs> companies you bought, not equities. I don't think you've ever sold one. I think you told us. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's, that's right. So, we, yeah. Long-term investor, hands off. Uh, he truly wants us to run the company. Uh, wants us to maintain the culture, and of course, if there is an opportunity for us to grow the company substantially, he's got plenty of capital. So it's just a, a marriage that we thought made a lot of sense. Jimmy's based in Knoxville, and we bought another company in Knoxville 14 years ago, Clayton Homes. Their employment has gone from 5,000 to 16,000, and they've seen me exactly once. They might have done better if, they, if I hadn't gone down the one time, but, but uh, Jimmy knows, and the families know each other, and... and uh, uh, so they've had a chance to check and see exactly how much we do interfere with operations. And through this, I wouldn't know how to build a manufactured home or a tr truck a travel center. Or a, uh, we depend on management. Right. Jimmy, you have seen some pretty phenomenal growth. I think you increased the number of stores you've had in the last two years by 10 percent. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we've been a growth company, like I said, from the get-go. And we have a pretty large market position now, but we're always looking for opportunities, Becky, to grow either organically to grow to buy a single stop or last year we partnered with Marathon Petroleum on 41 stops in the southeast. So over the last couple of years we've added 71 stops and still think there's an opportunity to continue to grow the company. Where, where, where are you not right now that you'd like to be? We're really, we're in 44 states. We're not in Alaska and Hawaii and some of the northeastern states that are small or tough to get in from a truck stop standpoint. So I think the growth will continue really in all segments of the country. Texas, obviously, with the natural growth Texas has, coupled with the oil industry, presents, I think, great opportunities. Hey, Warren, you, you know I'm jealous. I, I'm you. already practicing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know I'm jealous, uh, envious, uh, but, but I see, sometimes I see you do things where, I mean, I would, if I could buy Flying J, I wouldn't care if I ever made any money. I would just like to own Flying J. I'd like to own, do you ever do things just because you can? Just, I mean, are you going to make money on this, or? I like, see, like you look with Dairy Queen. You buy Dairy Queen. I don't think you're trying to make money there. You like Dairy Queen. You, what about C's Candies? You like C's Candies? And I want to own, why Flying J's? I love those places. There's showers, there's restaurants. There's, I mean, you're out on the road. You're like a cowboy and, and with the truckers and everything. You do things just because you can, I think. In his next segment, Mr. Buffett is going to tell you about how he found out about the Wells Fargo scandal. If you don't know about the Wells Fargo scandal, please go look it up. That's for another video to take too long to explain, but go look it up if you don't know about it. But he found out some things and he held some people's feet to the fire. He's also going to tell you about how he owns Wells Fargo and also about how he owns Bank of America, the majority of the, the state and those companies. And uh, yeah, this guy is doing some major, major things. If you don't know who he is, please go look him up. It happens to be the same day that Wells Fargo CEO Tim Sloan is headed to Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a long, messy process of trying to find out what happened at Wells Fargo. Tim Sloan is, is just the latest person who's being called before Congress with this. Um, but already, um, there's been a lot of sound and fury before he gets there. I want you to listen to a sound about coming from uh, Senator Warren, who was speaking with Jim Cramer recently on Mad Money. Go ahead and let's listen to what she had to say. You know, we had a hearing a year ago when John Stumpf, who had gone on your program, first one out of the barrel and said, hey, listen, I take personal responsibility for what's gone wrong at Wells Fargo. And then it turned out what personal responsibility meant was firing thousands of people who made 15 bucks an hour. You know, so we got John Stumpf in front of us, asked a few questions. Stumpf is no longer the CEO of Wells Fargo. But let's face it, there are still a lot of folks running Wells Fargo who were there at the time of the crisis. The problem is that the, the bank gets fined and the shareholders are the ones that pay for it. They didn't have anything to do with it, basically. Right. And, and I, I suggested that, that probably more extreme actions than Senator Warren in terms of clawing back all the director's fees for, I think, five years. And uh, I, I, I think that you really want, uh, you want the, as much as possible, you want the people that were responsible 
to pay, and, you, and ideally you would have the people who were innocent not pay, but it doesn't work that way uh, in, in the American uh, judicial system. I think that, that somebody messed up and the job is to find out who messed up and, and uh, ideally to make the penalties be such that it discourages other people in the future from, from doing similar things. Once you find out about it, you've got to get, get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over. And, and getting it right is hard. I mean, because uh, you, know, you turn over rocks and sometimes you find some things. And, and, and it's very seldom there's just one big thing going wrong in a big institution or something like that's going on. So you, you've got to get it right. And uh, the one thing you don't want to do is put out anything and be wrong about it. Uh, You're the largest shareholder in Wells Fargo. Do they still have your, um, your faith? Are you still behind the bank? Yeah, Tim Sloan has my faith. And uh, like I say, it happened to me at Solomon. Well, Solomon had my faith. It, it doesn't mean every person at Solomon had my faith after I got there. Uh, and, I got, and I had some surprises. I mean, I was worried about surprises every day. But the truth was that 99% of the people were perfectly decent people. They were just like the people working at Goldman or some other place. And, and somebody had gone off, the, totally gone off the, gone haywire. And, and other people didn't report it. Best. But when you find a problem, you have to jump on it. I mean, that is, uh, that's just basic. Okay. You are a uh, major shareholder in Bank of America, too. That's true. What's right. your favorite bank? What's my favorite bank? <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. What's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> the, but uh, the Bank of America has done a sensational job under Brian Moynihan. Uh, Brian had all kinds of problems when he came in. I mean, they were not of his own doing. But he had a ton of problems, and he had a lot of rocks to turn over, and it cost a lot of money. And he just set out step by step to bring the bank back. And he's gone from 280 or so thousand people down to 210,000. He's gone from a run rate of expenses in the 70 billions down to 54 billion. I mean, he, he has really done a job. And uh, you know, we will be, we'll be holders of B of A stock for a long, long, long time. Black truck, now I want you guys to really pay attention. Mr. Buffett gonna explain how he was able to get around taxes. That's the main thing that we're trying to avoid, taxes. Once you figure out how to maneuver around those taxes, you might be, find yourself a real loophole. But listen, pay attention, cause he gonna tell you how they do it. There are gonna be 2.6 million people die this year in the United States and there'll be 5,000 tax returns that people, states that pay tax. So if you start going to a funeral uh, every month, it's going to be 40 years on average before you go to one where there's any estate tax due. It's a very pejorative term. The truth is if they pass the bill that uh, they're talking about, uh, I could leave $75 billion to a bunch of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And if I left it to 35 of them, uh, they'd each have a couple billion dollars. They could put it out of 5%, have 100 million. I mean, is that a great way to allocate resources in the United States? Because that's what you're doing whether it's through the tax code is you're affecting the allocation of resources. So if they were lucky enough to come out of the right womb, have the right name Buffett, they could sit there and build tombs for themselves like the Egyptians, pharaohs never dreamt of. They, they, they could do anything. And, and capitalism is all about intelligent allocation of resources. Now, some people say, well, you don't have to worry about that because they'll blow it all. But if they blow it all, that means they, <laughs> they, you know, that they've done some dumb things with some important resources. And that's, that's not good for capitalism. I don't think it's good for the children. I sure, just, I sure don't think it's good for a society where there's a ton of inequality uh, to start with. Uh, I think it, I, I, I think it goes totally against what's built this country, what this country stands for. And if those 5,000 people can't stand to spend the 20 or 25 billion, they've got lots left over, believe me. Uh, uh, we have a lot of businesses, uh, 60 or 70. I, I don't think any of them are non-competitive uh, in the world because of the corporate tax rate. I mean, uh, American business earns a return on tangible equity under the present tax system that is extraordinary compared to history the last 100 years in America. I'm talking about tangible 
equity, but that's the money you actually invest. You could, uh, uh, and the five largest companies in the United States by market value, that's almost 10% of the value of the market, they don't need capital. It is, it is not like the old days where there's big steel companies and auto companies and oil refineries where huge amounts of capital were needed. But we, we are among the high earners of the world in terms of return on tangible assets. But just looking at the tax code, 35% is what we're supposed to be paying, what corporations are supposed yeah. to be paying. Most of them don't. A lot of they, them don't. A lot of them don't. And the ones that do are penalized because they're not taking advantage or they're not able to take advantage of the massive number of loopholes that have been built into the system. Isn't there an argument for saying, let's simplify this, let's level the playing field, make sure everybody's paying the same amount, that you can't snake your way around into a lower rate, right. and let's set up a tax code that, by the way, doesn't incentivize companies to keep cash overseas, bring it back here and potentially put it to work right here in America? Well, a, 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 a decrease in taxes would mean an increase in profits. It might, it might not be totally the amount of the decrease in taxes, but it would, it would increase earnings. There's no question about it. So the question is whether that's already built into expectations. I doubt if it, it fully is built into expectations. So, no, the lower the taxes go, actually, you know, if you had a negative tax rate for corporations, it'd really be great. <laughs> but uh, you're right about banks, incidentally. Banks tend to pay uh, a pretty full rate. Uh, uh, unless they, they, you know, they own some tax-exempt bonds, but that's not a big item. Some of them do some low-income housing tax credits and that sort of thing. But the tax rate on banks is right up there uh, among the top of, of various industries. So, so no, Warren, yeah, no, I'm just trying to just get exactly what, what, what you're saying, Warren. So if the money came back, it would be a good thing, but you don't want it to go, you don't want to induce them to send it over there in the future. So if you really oh. did go to 20 and you really did bring it back and because you're at 20 and there's no longer an inducement to go over there, why can't you just say outright that's a good thing? Why do you have to say, well, people are hyping it and their noses are growing? Why, why, why can't you just say, if we did it, 20% would be better here and it wouldn't go over there anymore so the money might stay here and the jobs might stay here? Why isn't that a good thing? Why don't you give, give us an endorsement of that if they could do it? Well, let's just say let's just say the the, the rate in some country was two percent, and you charge people ten percent ten ten percent for bringing it back, and you had a domestic rate that was twenty five or well, something like that. It's not two percent. It's not two percent. It's it's the lowest is twelve probably in Ireland. You think there'll be a race to the bottom if we do this? Is oh, that is that? Oh, there's rates lower than twelve. I, I you're right about Ireland, but there's. There's rates a lot lower than 12. And okay, I, so I, then, I then your argument is yeah. then it's yeah. a race to the bottom. You think it'd be a race to the bottom then at this point? Well, there's some of that. And, and one thing, in, interestingly enough, Joe, uh, the money is coming back uh, to some extent. When Berkshire Hathaway sells a bond issue, guess what? The, uh, the foreign subsidiaries of certain very cash-rich American companies buy those bonds. So the money comes back to Berkshire Hathaway. We pay interest to the foreign uh, subsidiary of the cash-rich country over there. But that money ends up in the uh, United States. Right. Think but of it this way. There's trillions think, over there, though, think right? Of having, I'd rather have the trillion. Isn't there yeah, two but, or three trillion? Can't, I'd, I'd much rather have that back here. Do some infrastructure. Yeah, let's, say you have, let's say you have two companies, company A and company B, and they both have a, a trillion dollars over there. And company A borrows a trillion from company B and company B borrows a trillion from company A. Now you've got all two trillion back here <laughs> and it, it's available for investment. I, that, see, you got, you're so smart. You know how to do all these things before they actually get done. That's why you love that second to die insurance. <laughs> you, you don't care about estate taxes <laughs> because you've got more things going on to get around it. And, uh, you, you just, you're just too smart. You're too smart. for If, if, we, if everybody no, had no. you running their money, we wouldn't need any, we wouldn't need any tax reform. I think that these guys are some major players in the game and they're actually running the game right now. A lot of the stuff that you see that's going on in the trucking industry, I think that it all plays a part in what they're trying to do and revamp and reshape the whole logistics world. So that's just my take. Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comment section. These guys seem to, to me that they're beefing or they're going at it to see who can make the most money. Like they in a full blown squabble. This guy, Warren Buffett, acquired Flying J Pilot back in 2017, which he only had so many uh, stakes in the shares. And um, 
He said by 2023, he's going to be running the whole thing. This guy, kids, 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 kids. If you know what I mean, it's going to eat off of his name. But make sure you uh, tell a friend, tell a friend, pay attention. Till next time, run away, child. And we are out.